My name is Dr. Eugene Malov. I'm uh, currently the editor-in-chief of the international science ma and energy magazine called Infinite Energy, published in uh, New Hampshire, uh, but now in 38 countries. Uh, also, I'm the director of the New Energy Research Laboratory, which is part of Infinite Energy Magazine. Uh, the actual corporation in the state of New Hampshire, right near Concord, is uh, called Cold Fusion Technology Incorporated. The magazine has been in existence since 1995. I have two engineering degrees from MIT, a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautical Astronautical Engineering in 1969, uh, I have a master's uh, degree from MIT, also in aeronautical astronautical engineering, 1970. I also have a doctorate, uh, SCD, doctorate in engineering, from Harvard University uh, School of Public Health in Environmental Health Sciences, 1975. I was the chief science writer at the MIT News Office when the coal fusion story out of Utah broke on March 23rd, 1989. And I was at MIT, my alma mater, as serving proudly as the uh, chief science writer in the news office. I encountered cold fusion uh, and uh, my entry into what might be called today, or is called today, the new energy area. Uh, because I was the chief science writer at the MIT News Office. And uh, it was essential at the time when P Drs. Pons and Fleischmann on March 23rd made their announcement at the University of Utah that they had created apparently a source of energy, they said, that had more energy coming out than in, in a, a jar of vessel of heavy water with, on which they had taken careful measurements. They thought that the amount of heat coming out was so large that it had to be a nuclear source. They were excellent chemists, world class. They could not um, see anything else but a nuclear explanation, even though they didn't have proof of it, other than the magnitude of the excess heat and some preliminary indications of uh, nuclear products. Uh, that's how it began. And, and by the way, it's always nice to mention that this was only 12 hours before the Exxon Valdez ran aground off Alaska, uh, a kind of a cosmic coincidence of great significance in some respect. Um, history will, will record that, I'm sure. What we really had was a threat to the scientific establishment. Uh, even if it were perceived, as it w was then and even today, as a, a bogus discovery, not a real discovery, not, a, not good science, bad science, false data, uh, even though that was and is on the minds of the hot fusion physicists today and the high energy physicists, the threat of it even being implied as real and having uh, monies, shall we say, being diverted from their favored programs, and uh, that was a threat, no question. There was an actual threat of that happening. It was real, overwhelmingly compelling, as I said, in Fire from Ice. It, it, it was real. Now it's 100% certain. In fact, what Pons and Fleischmann found was only the tip of an iceberg. And this is a huge controversy, one of the largest, maybe most intense, controversies in the history of science in the sense that it's occurring in the modern age, well documented in video and uh, print media and books and everything, uh, huge quantities of technical literature published by the proponents, a much smaller amount by the people who found so-called negative results. And the intensity of this controversy certainly uh, equals uh, controversies of the past like the Galileo Copernican revolution. Two very dramatic events occurred at MIT while the cold fusion story was evolving. Remember, March 23rd, 1989, the announcement. But within weeks, the hot fusion people were going into action behind closed doors to disprove them. I inadvertently was looking through some piles of paper that had been given to me in a casual manner by all these hot fusion physicists as they were trying to do their calorimetric uh, repeat of the pons fleischmann experiment. And to my utter astonishment, I can remember sitting at my desk in my study and actually seeing these two sheets of paper, the uh, wads of paper, reports, one dated July 10th, 1989, and another dated July 13th, three days apart. The difference between July 10th and 13th was dramatic. And my initial reaction was, oh, here's in July 10th, control experiment, light water, heavy water, the real Pons-Fleischmann experiment, 
showing in the raw data excess heat, what looked like excess heat on the graph. How, whether it was correct or not is not important, but it looked on the graph like, oh, gee, that's dominantly positive. Uh, one would conclude from that data alone, gee, uh, if we get that on the experiment, that's exciting, okay? But then on the 13th, it was shifted completely. It was altered. They did some standard averaging, which was appropriate, that is in time blocks, but the level of the signal had been utterly changed. And I was stunned. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It looked like monkey business to me at the time, and it has turned out to be exactly that. It was a lower echelon person in the plasma fusion center at MIT, one of the 16 authors of a scientific paper done under Department of Energy contract that had altered data. And that data is scientific fraud, as far as I'm concerned, and many other people are concerned. It was represented as a negative result when it was positive. Didn't prove cold fusion, even if it, the positive result was a legitimate positive. But the representation of the altered data as a negative was clear fraud. No question. It's been referred to legal authorities in the government. I asked for a review at MIT, got nowhere. If this type of manipulation had occurred in any legitimate research area, such as cancer research, AIDS research, global warming research, anything that's accepted as reasonable to be researching, and, and this kind of shifting were determined in a normal university uh, setting, the per people would lose their jobs, they wouldn't be in science. And yet, these people today, their data is used today, to year 2000, and all before, to reject patents. It's not the only thing they use to reject patents of American citizens and other people applying for cold fusion patents. But the MIT data is held up, Caltech data is held up, Harwell Laboratory in England data held up. It, it's a travesty, a very amazing thing. We know for a fact today that the cold fusion low energy nuclear reactions are real. It's a class of reactions of nuclear, of nuclear non uh, dangerous um, reactions producing dominantly heat but also nuclear changes. Very beneficial type of powerful reaction. Uh, that is a commercially emerging technology in the hands of a number of companies. It's difficult technology but it will under the proper circumstances of proper patenting and money and what have you, it will emerge as a, as a universal energy source. And I just want to say that at least one of the reactions is indeed cold fusion. Literally the joining of two heavy uh, hydrogen nuclei to form helium-4. This has been demonstrated repeatedly. Uh, case, uh, Dr. Les Case, MIT graduate, his process has been repeated at SRI International. There is absolutely no doubt about this. And what that means is that in one cubic kilometer of ocean, if you fuse all the heavy hydrogen, which is just one sixty-five hundredth of that cubic kilometer of, of ocean, that would equal the oil e energy of, of, of combusting all the known oil reserves on Earth. So for all practical purposes, we know today, scientifically, in a very careful manner, supported by a mountain of additional supporting evidence, that that at least is possible in principle and nearing commercial application. I believe that Cold fusion has opened my eyes to yet other possibilities. Uh, it definitely has opened my eyes to other possibilities. And these possibilities have now essentially come to become, in my mind, based on my evaluation of a number of devices I have seen or inferred or studied uh, without getting into details of what these devices are. Uh, in a few instances, I can say there are clearly over-unity electromagnetic devices, things that produce more electrical energy out than in. Uh, we are not in Kansas any longer. Uh, this is spectacular new physics. It indicates that some rather dramatic cracks exist in the foundations of physics. Electromagnetic theory require, will require radical revision. There has been an, there has been an extraordinary uh, abrogation of uh, basic uh, legal responsibility at the Patent Office, as an example, and at the Department of Energy on, on the matter of coal fusion. Coal fusion patents have not been approved. Okay. The only way of approving any patent that resembles coal fusion is to 
eliminate the words cold fusion or anything like it. Certain people have done that and succeeded. Okay, the Patterson power cell is one such example. And there was an age clause acceleration because of the age of Dr. Patterson that helped him. And it was through a different art group at the patent office that helped him also. But dominantly, if the patent goes through a certain gentleman at the patent office today, whose name is Harvey, uh, he will reject all such patents. They will not get through. American citizens are being denied their constitutional rights in this particular case. There is no question about it. We have a complete audit trail on that. Numerous inventors can show us the sheaves of press release, uh, not press releases, and newspaper clips from 1989 showing the failure to produce uh, reliable results, and that's supposedly disproving Pons and Fleischmann. Therefore, the inventor is being rejected on the basis of newspaper accounts. Also, the MIT negative experiment, so-called negative experiment, is introduced. No matter what affidavits as to its invalidity are, are, are put forward for courts and so forth. Yes, there, there is serious criminal activity going on that ultimately must be rooted out if the coal fusion new energy revolution, at least as far as hydrogen energy, uh, that is advanced hydrogen, anomalous physics energy is concerned. If it doesn't get rooted out, you will not be able to have a commercial infrastructure. The field of coal fusion has been marginalized by the establishment by creating certain myths about it. Uh, the, the, and, and pejorative terminology being used, which is highly inappropriate, has not, no, no bearing at all on, on what's being done, called pathological science, junk science, uh, weird science, voodoo science now is coming up from a, a certain individual at the University of Maryland. And it's just basically name calling. They no longer look at the data. Of course, they never really looked at the data. They had a bad frame of reference to begin with. They said it must work like hot fusion. Well, this was in a solid state. It's just like saying the, the, the equivalent of demanding that cold fusion works like hot fusion is like saying a transistor works like a radio tube. It's idiotic. It's stupid. It makes no sense. And yet that's what was demanded. So they made straw men. There must be this product or this radiation or, or we're not going to believe it. There are prominent coal fusion critics who have uh, established a very strong position. Uh, they have put their foot in their mouth, so to speak, and they find it very difficult, if not impossible, to adjust their thinking. Um, they can't admit they were wrong. Perhaps at some level they have a subconscious fear that they're wrong, but they think they can get away with it now by continuing to act as though it doesn't exist. Uh, much has happened after the, uh, the Wright Brothers airplane flew, and there was very much controversy about that from 1903 to 1908. One prominent critic who said it would never fly, it never would be real, could never be done, uh, Simon Newcomb, the um, astronomer at the time, uh, he poo-pooed it even after he said, oh yes, well, I guess they really do have it after all. Uh, but it won't have passengers, it won't be practical, and so forth. Yeah, this whole litany has occurred many times in other controversies. This one is particularly intense because of the threat to academic wisdom. There's nothing worse, uh, I've found, than suggesting to academic physicists in particular, and academics in general, that they are not only wrong, but disastrously wrong, catastrophically wrong. And that once they are proved and shown in public to be the fools that they are and the bad actors that they are, there's possibly going to be some punishment for them in terms of the loss of prestige and, and what have you. That's, that's why they're resisting. In the bulk, even, it will interact in a sort of a nonlinear optics fashion. It will do phase conjugation. And so eventually what it, what it does is everything going on is feeding energy into the earth starts to feed energy into that wave that he created. So he gets a lot more energy in his resonant wave fed from outside, from the environment in the interior of the earth. And that's the way he built up a, a humongous wave of energy.